I want to do a word problem from the book, and uh, it's one of these problems about headwinds and tailwinds, and so it's going to be number 13 on page 133. Um, but first, I want to justify a little bit more why headwinds and tailwinds and things work this way, uh, the way they do. So I actually want to talk about a little bit of a different situation first, and that's um, a train moving on a track. I used to draw these all the time for my son, not so much anymore. Um, it's, it's got a flat car, okay, and they got they got various stuff, got the engine pulling the train over here, and so it's moving, and then there's somebody walking on the flat car. Okay, and what I want to figure out is if I know how fast the train is moving, let's say the train is moving, let's say a it's not moving too fast. Let's say it's moving uh, like 20 feet per second. Okay. <clears throat> and that's the train's motion relative to the ground. Let me write that. Train relative to ground. And this is the thing about motion and speed and velocity. We don't always um, emphasize this, but the speed, whoops, the speed or velocity of something is always a relative notion. It's always a relative measure. Um, and this is the train relative to the ground. That's what somebody standing on the ground, fixed on the ground, would say about how fast the train's moving. Now let's say this guy is walking at four feet per second. Now that what I mean by that is that that's how fast he's walking relative to the flat car. If he were blindfolded and didn't know he were on a train, first of all, he'd fall off and die, and that would be bad. Um, although I have a relative who died by falling off a train. Um, that's not really neither here nor there. Um, if he were blindfolded and didn't know he was on a train, he would just say, I'm walking on flat level ground four feet per second. So what that really is, is that's if somebody were sitting on the, on the flat car, Ignoring the fact that they're both moving relative to the ground, that's how that person would describe the motion, four feet per second. Now let's look at what's going to happen one second later. The train has moved. Let's look at the black back end of the flat car. Um, that flat car has moved because it was going 20 feet per second relative to the ground. That has moved 20 feet. Okay, so that's where I put the back end of the flat car now. And the person has moved with respect to the flat car. So here's where the person started out. That's going to be pretty important. And how far has the person moved? Well, here's where the person was, is right above that wheel. In terms of where the flat car, that person has moved four feet. So the person is now here. And this distance here is four feet. Oh, you know what? I should have I should have had him start right at the back of the flat car. So actually what I want to mark is twenty feet. Is this this point. Let's look at the point where he started. That's better. This point has moved twenty feet. There we go. So we're keeping track of that point on the flat car where he happened to be right at the start of that second, and then a second later, that point has moved, as far as the ground observer is concerned, has moved 20 feet. But the this guy's moved 4 feet. So in one second, as far as the ground is concerned, he's moved 24 feet. So the um, the ground velocity, or the ground, let's just say ground speed, velocity is a little more precise word, but the ground speed is 24 feet per second, and that's the sum of those two individual speeds. So his speed relative to the train and the train relative to the ground, you add those up to get the ground speed, that's the speed relative to the ground, of that person. Now, if he was walking the other way, now first of all, in that picture, he would definitely fall off but that's because he's blindfolded and because we've played a very cruel and illegal trick on him. But let's suppose um, the train's still moving this way 
And let's say, so that he doesn't die, he'll start here. And then, one second later, we've got um, this, the train has moved on 20 feet. I guess that was about the length of the flat car, something like that. Okay, let's say it's about the length of the flat car. Maybe it's about here. Okay, so this point where he was to start with has moved 20 feet right above the, the middle of the wheels now. Okay. But he was moving, let's say he's moving this way, at four feet per second. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. And now, so this, he's right here. And this distance is four feet. So, according to the ground observer, he, he saw, he, the guy saw him here, and now he sees him here. And now it's just 16 feet. So according to the ground observer, if he's just paying attention to that guy, doesn't pay attention to the fact he's on a train or whatever, all he sees is that this guy moves 16 feet in one second. And so now his ground speed, 16 minus 4, sorry, 20 minus 4, which is 16. Okay. So, that's the basics of relative velocity, and um, or relative speed. This velocity, again, is a more precise word. Um, we won't worry about the difference right now. The thing about planes is it's exactly the same situation, but it's a little hard to, to convince yourself of that, because the, the, what substitutes for the, the train in that example is just a big packet of air. And that's rather, rather more insubstantial. So it's hard to convince your subconscious that it really has this, it can play the same role. So here, there's the plane. It's moving, but if you look at an instrument on the plane, the way it figures out how fast it's moving and what determines whether it can fly or how it's flying or how much fuel it uses or whatever is the speed relative to a big old packet of air that it's sitting in. Okay, and let's use the... <coughs> the um, books, letters for those, they call that the wind speed. So maybe, f for example, that might be 80 miles per hour. And then the plane, as far as he thinks, he just looks at how fast the, the, the air is rushing by the plane, basically, because that's going to measure how, how fast the plane is moving through the air. Let's say that's 400 miles per hour. Just like the, the, the example of the guy on the train, he's moving 400 miles per hour inside a big packet of wind that's itself moving 80 miles per hour, and so the ground speed of that plane would be 480 miles per hour because it's a tailwind pushing on his tail. Uh, literally, I guess, since he's a plane, he actually has a tail. Um, and that's where those speeds are going to add. And so the ground speed is the plane speed plus the wind speed for a tailwind. For a headwind, pushing into his head against him, the ground speed, it's very much like the the example of the guy walking on the train, that's where the wind would be pushing this way against his motion, and the ground speed is less than the plane speed. Okay, So these, you know, when you have to just these three letters, it's really hard to tell what's plus, what's minus. You have to really think about the meaning of each one and, and what makes sense, and put, putting in explicit numbers is a good idea for that to make it make sense. Okay, so that's a, a little review of relative motion and why we have those P and W. Next video, we're actually going to solve number 13.